Uh, hello, this is uh, iBook My News podcast. Uh, uh, today, our guest uh, uh, is uh, Katie Abbott, uh, bookbinder and book. Uh, are you a book restorer or you are a book conservator? I would say a, a book conservator with a restoration lilt, I would say. <laughs> okay. So I, uh, everything I do is conservation sound. So, okay. But I do, I do touch in and things like that, which the, some conservators might not like. Okay. Probably a book. And also, Katie is a, a bookbinding teacher, and uh, we will talk about all these things. And uh, my co-host uh, joins us from Moscow. Pavel, hi. Hi. Wearing our new merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, where's your mask? <laughs> I start. <laughs> well. Okay. And I'm Stepan. And uh, yeah, let's let's begin. Uh, I. I First thing I wanted to ask you about uh, on your website, you write uh, that you were an apprentice, a bookbinding apprentice for four years before you really started on this endeavor. And mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a bit about this? Because uh, uh, bookbinding apprenticeship is something that uh, in, in many countries, it's not non-existent anymore. And, but, but it seems that in the UK, there still is a, a, a practice of uh, being a bookbinding apprentice or there was a practice some time ago. Yeah. So how, how was it and what, what is it today? Okay, so I started my apprenticeship in 1989 um, and I was apprenticed in a kind of big trade bindery in north of London and it was 65 men and I was the only girl. Okay. For four years and never there was never a girl before me or after me I was the only one <laughs> but it was really tough it, I've got two brothers and I'm used to having men in my house all the time so it was okay for me but I don't think many women would have been able to cut it it was hard hard <laughs> and yeah. you have to prove yourself all the time so uh, it was four years and it was part bench work and then there were some uh, mechanized practices so you had to do some days I don't know taking work off a machine and stacking it but then quite a lot of the time was bench work and then one day per week they sent me to uh, the London College of Printing for more craft bookbinding training um, so that was quite good you got paid to go to college as well one day per week and yes yeah, so they it's quite strange because uh they they didn't want me to work there no way they because it was all men um they thought they were offering offering me a job in the women's sewing plant shop <laughs> in the work yeah it was in another building it wasn't even in the same building so th there was a separate location for women there exactly and so that was what they thought I wanted to do but I said I'd love to learn to sew but I want to learn how to build books how to make yeah. books in the end I had to threaten them with sexual discrimination and then they let me in and they thought I would never last they all had bets that I would never last but I, I did and it was it was great and horrible and wonderful it was it was such a contrasting confliction of everything so the funniest time I've ever had in my life I've never laughed so much in my entire life as then it was so funny but it was really hard boring sometimes um, but hard tough and you and I would never ask for any help never I would rather die than yeah. ask for help because I just had to prove myself and they ended up absolutely loving me they they were so sad to see me go when I left and they were wonderful they all collected money for me to help me on my journey they were wonderful and I still see them we have an annual uh, reunion every year <laughs> so it's quite strange um, being with the men and there's their wives and I'm my husband has, <laughs> is the odd one and so there's the wives and I'm friends with the men, all the men. Um, this is this just yeah. sounds sounds insane that you you have to prove you, yourself double, not only as an yeah. apprentice but also as a woman. And uh, yeah, it's well, really. 
uh, end of 1980s, it's it's just not not so far back in time. And uh, but it's a lifetime ago in yeah. in, in terms of development of where we are. Yeah. My, so, uh, so would you say the situation has changed? Yes, definitely. There's predominantly women now as bookbinders. It's very, very, in that time, there weren't many women bookbinders, and now it's predominantly book, women bookbinders. Uh, how, how, uh, how and when did it change? I think just slowly, because I think as some of the trade binderies closed, more people got filtered into the craft bookbinding route. Um, so then more women got attracted to it. it it used to just be seen as a quite a physical male dominated um business i mean all the other companies the trade binders that were associated with the binder i worked in they were all male dominated binders as well hardly any women um and when i went to college there were lots of other apprentices sent and there was only one other girl there were rest men it's it was we were the only two on a whole course full of men it was it was really like going back into Victoria and England it's really strange and it's completely different so you're back to your question it has changed now so the apprenticeship system I was the last year in 19 I finished in 1993 and that was the last year they took apprentices so my, I was the last one in the last group of apprentices. Then they started a trainee system, which had none of the union protection of apprenticeship. So it was different. It was a way to, you could, I think, probably a bit of abusing of labor, you know, cheap labor. So, so basically unpaid internship. You got paid, but very little, but you had no protection. You had no rights, like zero hours contracts. You know, you, you could be chucked out at any time but as an apprentice you had a huge amount of protection legally really because it's the ancient guilds the English guild system so we were journeymen you, you know it's all, all this archaic language um it continued and the practice the uh the head of the union was called the father of the chapel it, it's really really archaic but it comes from the monastic and all the guilds. So it's it's got the massively ancient history. And I, I really respect it that, that it stayed, the rules stayed all those years. So then they did away with it. And then I can't remember what year it was, but the government decided to bring in apprenticeship systems back because there are a lot of young people that were unemployed. But it's only kind of infiltrated into bookbinding in probably the last six years with the um, with the Windsor Castle project, yeah. Queen's yeah. Bindery, um, which was wonderful and I'm devastated it's ended. I'm devastated for those poor apprentices because it was such an amazing opportunity and, uh, and it, they, there's nothing out there for anyone that's starting bookbinding like that. Well, so maybe, they, maybe now when there is this uh, recent experience, there will be something else in, 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 the, in the future, maybe after COVID uh, finally ends and... Uh, yeah, and if they get, they, they say, if they get the funding again after COVID, they might be able to restart it. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. It definitely I'm, helps. I'm involved in, that, in the project and I really support it. I'm, I'm one of the... Um, supporters of the of the uh, system, the apprenticeship system there. So, I really support it. You you mentioned that uh, uh, college was also male dominated. Uh, am I right? Well, when I was sent, it's called yeah. day release. Day yeah. release male yeah. dominated. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 interesting because uh, I feel I I in my understanding is that in in Soviet Union. Uh, all these bookish uh, majors were often considered to be a girly thing to do. Really? And uh, uh, they were, uh, for example, in the uh, um, Institute of Printing in Moscow, uh, it, it sort of was supposed that there were more, more girls there than, than, uh, than boys. And it's also sexist, like a lot. <laughs> But uh, but it's interesting that it, it's it's sort of an, an opposite what what you saw and uh, and how it was and uh, um, mm. I don't know why. Yeah, it it was just really like a hangover. 
from the past. It was yeah. it just carried on. And the, a lot of those binders in there, it was just a job to them. It wasn't a passion. Oh, yeah. So I, I was very unusual that I was so hungry for it. I, I wanted to learn. Teach me. What? Oh, oh, it's just that. No, teach me. I want to learn. I want to be better. And, and it, they said, no, you just got to do it quickly. You know, so, and they couldn't. Then they, they did really respect that I wanted to take it further and they really respect what I've done with it from there, what I've gone on to do. So. Uh, was it also a family thing, like father passing his trade onto his son and so on and so on? Was, uh, the, the bindery I, I worked in was called McDermott and Chant and there was Ben Chant and his son took over Tim Chant and then now there's another Chant that, that, that runs it. So yes, it was passed down. So the, the binder still exists. It's just a bit it's smaller. A, it's tiny now. It's yeah. absolutely tiny. And it's not it, where there were 65 men and me. So it was quite a big bindery before. Um, now there's probably 15 or something like that. So it's quite well, small. It's in the modern times, uh, 15, 15 book binders in one, uh, in one uh, yeah. uh, uh, company is, is quite a lot. So <laughs> it is still quite big, but for, from what it was, it was huge. And the building was huge, absolutely huge, with all different departments. It's 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 so interesting that you had uh, such a wide experience uh, over not not really a long time, uh, uh, just uh, a couple of decades or three decades, and uh, uh, and and you 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 have this uh, ability to to see how everything has changed and. Uh, I feel so lucky that I've had the training I've had because I went from my apprenticeship to full time at the London College of Printing when I left to do a higher national diploma and then after that I topped it off with a BA Bachelor of Arts Honours degree at Roehampton which was like a Swiss finishing school for bookbinding it was I became polished then and my knowledge was huge and then after that I went to work at Bernard Quaritch Limited, which is one of the biggest antiquarian book dealers and oldest antiquarian book dealers in London. And I worked there as the bindery manager for nine years. So that was another education. So really, I, I've had like 17 years of learning. Yeah, almost almost <laughs> like a doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, definitely eight years solid training. Yeah. And then nine years, it's, it is like being a doctor. It's like yeah. going in practice where you you become a registrar and then a surgeon yeah but I'm so grateful because my knowledge is vast because of my training and I'm lucky I'm really really lucky um, I have a question I, I, I like to ask this question can you remember back to the moment when you realized well now I am a master of my own craft what was that project when you saw it and whoa I can do that I don't remember a specific moment, but I remember, I think it was probably quite a way in um, when I was working at, after working at Quaritch, because the work at Quaritch is unbelievable. What you get put on your bench, you might have a 13th century medieval manuscript one second, and then you've got Shakespeare's first folio coming through the door, and then you've got everything you can possibly think of and you start to lose fear so you you're always scared and then you start I remember stop being frightened and then and I knew with confidence what to do how to do it how much it was going to cost how long it was going to take and my confidence grew and that was I think from Quaritch just because the book dealers at Quaritch have no con preconception of how long things take so they'll say a client coming tomorrow and there's two boards off a book they could come in tomorrow can you can you do this you go by tomorrow <laughs> you mad <laughs> you know, and the spine half hanging off I mean, I mean some somehow we did do miracles and make things happen by the next day but you know they it was unbelievable and there's pressure and the stress because you you're working on sometimes million pounds worth of, of book. Yeah. Uh, we talked we talked to Sophia Bogle uh, during our first season and uh, uh, she she 
talked a lot about this disconnect between uh, book, book restorers and uh, booksellers and uh, uh, she even wrote a book to help booksellers and book collectors to you know to understand book restore a bit better but uh, uh, it's it's especially uh, not not strange but uh, uh, not upsetting I don't, I don't know what word to use uh, to, but it, it, it is strange to hear that uh, within uh, an antiquarian uh, book selling uh, uh, company, uh, there is this disconnect as well. And, uh, Even the language we use is different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, say, can you bind this in paper over boards? You go, what's that? And it's a paper case binding or <clears throat> from this full Morocco, where we would say full goatskin or, you know, to what the language is always different so we have, I have to you have to learn the, their language and then they have to learn your language to to understand one another quite and and, and what about the ethics because I uh, uh, from what I understand some booksellers have very <laughs> different ideas what is okay to do yeah fortunately Quaritch is a very very um, reputable uh, company they might ask you to do something that you don't feel is right. It's not that it's wrong. Like they might say this binding we could sell for more if we take it apart, but it's a beautiful binding with historic, you know, importance as a as a binding. And you go, no, I can't, I can't do it. And and quite often they would respect you if you said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm really sorry. I don't, I don't think it's right. I'm sorry. Um, so they were a very unusual company, but a lot of book dealers are, are really, you know, there's a lot of very unscrupulous work goes on. Yeah. Where, where do you draw the line? For example, would you ever uh, reattach a binding from one book to, uh, to another? Would you uh, uh, take... Uh, 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 marble paper from uh, from uh, from one board and then transfer it to another. There are many questions like that. Where do you draw the line? It's it's sort of case by case, but we have had people give us old papers, and you th you say it's not right. You know, it's not even the right country that this is this originates from. But they they. They then say, well, this is what I want. And I'm saying it's a new binding. I'm not pretending it's a new binding. If someone was pretending it was an, an ancient binding, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing fakes. But if somebody says I'm declare, if they're declaring in a recent sympathetic binding, it's, it's really, it's a good question. And it's a challenge always about what I feel comfortable doing and what I don't. Um, Everything I use is conservationally sound. Uh, I wouldn't use any materials. I don't like, I wouldn't reuse old boards from another book um, or old end papers from other books because of the acid migration, because of the, the it's not historically or geographically correct. So no, but things, I would tone a paper back to make it look older, so I do things like that, but that would be hand toned with acrylic, uh, conservation grade acrylic paint. So everything's sound, but I do do things to make them look less new. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what about how detectable restoration should be? Because there is uh, this, uh, these two conflicting ideas. On one hand, a lay person should, uh, should, uh, shouldn't see. Uh, that uh, something is restored. But on the other hand, a specialist should be able to detect it. Yes, I. this is what I said right at the beginning. So I'm a book conservator with a, conserva with a restoration lilt. So my clients, quite often them, a lot of them are in the book trade. They want it, they don't want a screaming repair. If you work in a museum or an institution, I understand that you, you keep conservation pure. But I, I have no qualms about touching things in to make them less visible, as long as it's reversible, as long as you can reverse it. Yes, I, I'm sure that if anyone really looks, they can see that it's been, uh, that it, there's been work, but, but not always. 
um, sometimes the work goes so well that you can't see it's absolutely invisible what I've done. But there it is. Sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's not. It's kind of the luck of the draw sometimes, how well something goes down. Or I'm, I'm quite good at colour matching, so I can tone in something very well. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it, I'm probably, a, a, cons a pure conservative would probably have issue with some things I do, and a restorer would find me too much of a purist. So I'm kind of in, in between camps. But I, I feel comfortable because everything I use is reversible. Everything I do is reversible. And all the materials I use are archival or acid-free. or So I, I don't use anything that is controversial so I can, I can sleep at night with my decisions <laughs> uh, could you perhaps talk a bit more about the reversible bit because i often hear this word uh, especially from museum people library people restorers but what does it actually mean can you mm -hmm. how difficult is it um it can be quite difficult to reverse things but um i think a lot of it's to do with adhesives so using I don't use PVA at all I will not use PVA I use EVA and I'm, I don't know if you know the, the different what why they're used uh, do you want me to, to say it or well <laughs> yeah definitely and uh, I know the chemical formula but I have no idea what in practical terms the difference is so polyvinyl acetate and ethylene vinyl acetate, PVA and EVA. Polyvinyl acetate has been found to emit acetic acid in time, and that has a detrimental effect on paper and books. So especially in a box situation, if a book's in a box made with PVA, it's in a, an acetic acid gas chamber, which is not going to do the book any favours. Ethylene vinyl acetate does not emit acetic acid or there have been some formulas that they've had to adjust with the emit tiny amounts, but uh, slowly and over time. Whatever you do with a, if you make a box, you should off gas it, leave it open for a few days to let the the uh, gases come away from it. So PVA, EVA is much more reversible. It's really easy to reverse EVA. Um, we had a we had a great test with Quaritch really when we, it was quite new EVA was had it wasn't commonplace to use EVA. We had a book that we had bound that was in pamphlets that it was one binding and then they brought it back and said we want this disbound into three pamphlets. So this was the it was a few years later and it, it reversed so easily so I reverse it with um, xanthan gum is my preferred choice because xanthan gum suspends water in its mass and slowly slowly it's a slow release uh, without any risk of tide mark or or so you can make a poultice with xanthan gum you can put it on um, EVA and it softens within 10 minutes it's and no risk to the but you don't get any damp staining any set and you can actually put xanthan gum direct onto something and it doesn't leave any shine any residue nothing so i have put it into practice so and i always make my own adhesive my own paste so never buy ready made so there's no fungicides there's no preservatives they're all water-based so i i know i have reversed i can reverse anything i've done there's nothing that's permanent. We, while while we also uh, talk to um, a colleague uh, from from Harlem, from from here from the Netherlands, with Eliana Gomez, uh, mm. uh, we discussed that uh, uh, the uh, conservation field changes so much every year with new materials, new chemicals, new approaches, and that. Uh, uh, many of the manuals and recommendations that were issues like issued like ten years ago are already absolutely obsolete today. Yeah. So uh, you've got to keep up to date all the time. Yeah, and uh, book binders are guilty of sticking to what they know. They don't like change. I like I like this paper because I've always used this paper. I like this glue because I've always used this glue. It's indefensible. 
Well, okay. not not only bookbinders. I know some, uh, or I know of some uh, conserv even conservators, not only yeah. restorers, who <laughs> stick to the old guns and they continue to use methods uh, used in I don't know Soviet Union or mm -hmm. something. And uh, and uh, to, to today it seems like some, something completely ruinous. And uh, well, maybe some of the methods still stay, uh, uh, but but many of them are are not really good <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I mean, we all used to use things like chemicals like benzene and things like that in things, and we, now we don't. We know we, we know that they're bad, so we don't use them anymore. But it, you've got to keep up to date with your practice. You've got to keep researching and reading papers of what they're finding, because they'll probably find in five years or another 20 years that something with EVA might be different and they'll change the polymers for that. Who knows? Or they'll find a different adhesive that's even better. Who knows? And what so about like and what about the cleaning methods? Because when I uh, re uh, I've been reading about what they're doing in uh, the British Library and they're using some devilishly high tech methods like uh, uh, frost and vacuum and whatnot. Yeah, see, uh, this is if it if something required that kind of treatment, I would send. I don't have any issue about sending it to a specialist. I, I don't think I have to do everything if I don't know how to do something, or I always know my limits. If somebody says, "Can you do this?" I, and I think I'm not. I'm not sure I can. I don't think I know enough. I send it to someone who does know because. Um, so I, I, I don't have high tech kit here and this is a bindery so we can only we can only do what we can do here it's not a sterile we haven't got a lab here at Quaritch we had a lab and a bindery and a dirty room oh my god it was a dream workshop so we could pair in the dirty room we had the conservation lab and then we had the bindery it was wonderful but we don't have that here. We've been there for 20 odd years and we don't have, <laughs> it's just what it is. So I can't, we can't, we don't even wash books here because it's not clean enough. Mm -hmm. So something needs to be washed. We send it to someone to be washed. Uh, and what, what about the, the books that have fungal infections on them? What then they would be sent to someone to be frozen and, and dealt with, with the, by freezing and then defrosting and then the chemical or the uh, the surface cleaning of that in a um, a booth. What do you call it? My, my brain's gone empty. A thing, <laughs> a booth that you so you don't get the spores of you know. So you're fully kitted because if you breathe in, yeah, fungal, okay. yeah. your lungs are going to be horrendous. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine because I have all sorts of allergies, including. Uh, allergies on all, all the stuff that grows in the book. So yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty scared of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and so you've got to have the full kit for that. Yeah. If people, some clients have brought us moldy books and we go, no, 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 stop, stop. No, don't unwrap it, don't unwrap it. Give it to me and we'll send it somewhere. Especially white mold, my God, and black mold, you know, live molds coming in here. And insects and things like that. No, yeah. they can't come in here. They have to go somewhere else to be treated. Wait, wait, wait. Are bookworms still a thing? Yeah, they're not worms. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, they're, they're very much a thing. They are very much a thing. They're so and so's. Yeah, they're still very active, very, very. There's, they love um, anything with gelatin or shellac or so I do a lot of Islamic conservation and they love Islamic because of the gum Arabic and the shellac on lacquer bindings yum. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I wanted to ask you next and you you sort of uh, uh, went forward <laughs> yeah because uh, Islamic bindings it's it's a, it's a very interesting niche and uh, uh, well it's I guess it should be a great pleasure to work with them, but how it happened to be that you started to work with uh, specifically in Islamic bindings? It's, it was sort of an accident. Um, so when I was at Roehampton, we studied Islam, we studied the history of the book and we made every single thing that can be made. Cuneiform, clay tablets, wax tablets, palm leaf books, the lot. We went right through the history of the book. 
And we were fortunate enough to have um, Duncan Haldane, who's written a book on Islamic findings, and he was the head of the Islamic department at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So we, he was our tutor for that thing. So we learned all about Islamic findings. I'd studied them and made models. And then it just sat dormant. And then I worked with a paper conservator who's a specialist Islamic paper conservator. And I made some boxes for this uh, conservator. And then um, the, her binder that she used died, sadly. <laughs> and so there was a, so she said, do you know how to bind in the Islamic style? So yes, I, I know certain, amount but that was back in 1998 so I started in 1998 and I'm still learning I'm still learning all the time you know they're they're very different to western bindings and the way you approach them is very different some things are very similar but I don't ever make pastiche um, new bindings I make very plain bindings because it's not my culture I don't understand it it's I'm not going to do the Islamic decoration it's not my culture I, I don't feel comfortable with that so any new binding I do is plain it still might have an envelope flap it's still in the correct way it's bound in the correct way but it's no decoration or just a gold line or a blind line something very very minimal that's also something that uh, I wanted to talk about because when you when when a person browses through your website, uh, there is this pattern of uh, minimalist approach to design that uh, one can uh, see in your bindings. And it's, it's so beautiful because with just a small stroke of, uh, of color or, or of, of, uh, of some different sort of leather or, or with some tooling or something, you make the book absolutely different and unique. And uh, uh, many binders try to, you know, to overcrowd the, the cover with uh, tooling or with uh, some design patterns or something. But with your bindings, it's, it's so simple it's, and straightforward, but then it tells a story. Mm. It, it, it's the way I am. I, I am a minimalist at heart. I'm really interested in art movements such as the modernist movement, Bauhaus, it's that's kind of my aesthetic. I dress very plainly. I my house is quite minimal. There's not a lot of clutter. It's just my aesthetic. It's what I like. I like the architecture of modernism. I love that pure, clean line, Scandinavian designs, Danish furniture, all of that. So it, it's naturally in me. But what I do is when I read a book, I'm, I'm a massive, passionate, passionate reader. And I feel so strongly about the books I bind. But I, I have loads of ideas at first. Oh, it could be this, it could be that. And you should, my notebook's full of this, that, references that I write while I'm reading. And I distill and distill and distill and distill and distill and I, I ends up I want my ultimate goal is to achieve the essence of that text with as little as possible as I as I feel is right but sometimes it might need a bit more but um, I try to distill it down to the essence I don't like if it's a book about you know I don't know butterflies that it's got butterflies on it that's just never going to happen with my, my work never <laughs> well this is something that we also discussed with uh, mark okram just just a few days ago uh that uh, it is uh, uh it is sort of wrong to restrict yourself with your own binaries that you you set for yourself and uh, well mm. it's it's great to have this minimalist approach but if the project uh, demands something else yes, it's good to try something else yeah, exactly. Every book I read, it's not, I, honestly, honestly, it's not my ego on my bindings. My bindings are pure response to the text. So if the books, not all of my bindings are really, really quiet. They're quieter than a lot of people, but some have hardly anything on them and some can be quite decorative, but still restrained decor decoration. But that's because that's my aesthetic. But 
um, if it requires something jolly and nuts, then I'll do it. Absolutely. Because I'm a very fun person. <laughs> I like, I, I'm very happy. I like, I'm, I'm a very jolly person. So I, I, I would like something. It's not, I don't want it to be like some intense, hard, <laughs> punishing thing on my bindings. I, they should be joyful as well, but I want them to be beautiful. And the other thing that I think um, is interesting is when you are a minimalist, there's nowhere to hide. So if your bindings aren't good, you'll see everything. If you've got a mark, if you've got a scar, if you've got a dent, you've got you've paired badly, you've chamfered your boards bad. There is nowhere to hide. So they, I think maybe some people might think my work is really simple, but it, it often isn't. Every, every binding I do challenges me in a way that I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this thing that I've got in my mind, but I, I, I have a yearning to do it. So they look simple, but I think they're deceptively simple sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, simplicity is often deceptive, and uh, that's just how it is. <laughs> yeah. I really wanted to ask you a bit more about your experience with Islamic books, because Islamic wo uh, world uh, is an awfully big one, bigger than Western world. Islamic books and Islamic book bindings have been made from Malaysia to Uzbekistan to Iran to Syria to Morocco to Spain. Yeah. And, could you uh, talk a bit about your experience, experience of this variety? Um, well, probably all of that, but I've, I've worked on, I've worked on them from all over the, the world, um, and they're all different. So yeah, a, a Thai Islamic manuscript is very different to an Iranian, Persian manuscript. So my training was mostly in the three classic kind of Islamic styles, which is the Ottoman Turks, the Persian Iranians, and the Indian uh, culture of, of, of uh, Islam. So they were the ones I was tra trained in, but subsequently I've worked on things from Bhutan, from Malaysia, from Thailand. So the Southeast Asian things are very different too. And then African uh, Islamic bindings are different to their, and then Spanish Moorish ones are very different to, they're all different. So you learn all the time. I don't, I don't always know what, there are commonalities that you can re, re, go to what your knowledge is, they're common themes. But if there's something I'm not sure about what I'm doing, I won't do it. So I, I only do what I feel confident is the right thing to do. So yeah, they're, they're very, very different. Uh, is, is there enough literature on the subject or do you have to contact your colleagues? Are there many of those? Uh, and, and what is your research process in general? Because uh, uh, British Empire uh, uh, had, had, had a lot of, you know, influence, not influence, influx of knowledge and uh, uh, all the stuff from all, all over the world. Uh, uh, but uh, is, it, is it an accessible knowledge now and is it helpful? Um, I think... I mean, I, again, I was really lucky. I have been really lucky to work, say, somewhere like Quaritch. We had an Islamic department. So, and there's nothing like looking at real live material. So I can read, I've got lots of Islamic books on the ones that, the classic books that you read about Islamic bindings. I can read them and they are useful. Petherbridge and... Um, Bosch, that one I, is an invaluable source. That's a really good source because it covers all of the different cultures. But there's nothing like looking at, uh, at the real deal and five of them, not just one, five of them to say commonalities in a Turkish Ottoman binding of the 13th century or because of course they even change in centuries. And they're, they're a nightmare Islamic manuscripts because they pillage, they pillage all the time. So a, bind, a book, a manuscript is very rarely in its original binding. 
they borrow bindings. The binding falls off. They find one that fits. They put them together. They don't even always fit. They're, and then they've got extra bits bolted on. That they're they're real Frankenstein monsters sometimes. They're, so it's even hard to judge and date because they've got so many add-ons, so many add-ons. And then you get a Western binder comes in, and tries to round and back them and put mull on the back you know <laughs> so you, you you get it goes crazy it's it's you're just learning on I learn on the job really by looking I haven't because I'm a, I'm a working I'm not a scholar so I haven't got time to sit and read five books on the subject before I start work I'm being paid to start work and and the client might want the book by next week I haven't got time to sit and read five books on the subject so I've got to go on my knowledge luckily I've got a lot of knowledge now from 1998 to now it's, it's quite a lot of years of of looking at these things so I do understand a lot but loads I don't know of course not because it's not my culture but can you just go to say VNA or British Library and ask to see those binding? Because it's very difficult in Moscow. Uh, uh, if the, uh, if uh, uh, the book is older than say 150 years, it needs a special permission. You need to write to the director of the library. And if you are not in, uh, uh, don't have a PhD in this subject, you are very unlikely to get access. Is it any di uh, different? Yeah, the, you're lucky here because you can, you can have access to things. And because I work with book dealers, um, I have, they let me have access to things. I can look at things. Have, have you got something I can see? Do you know if, can you have a look inside? Does it have this? Or I can ask questions. Yeah. I'm, it's we are lucky here. We have a, a lot of access, but I don't have time to go to the VNA for the day anymore. I used to when I studied, but I, I can't do that. That's four hours of my time gone. I can't do that. I can't equate. I can't put that into the cost of my binding repair. So you just got to get on with it. Well, London and then UK is definitely a center of uh, book arts in many ways. So uh, yeah, it's 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 an amazing place in in this way that there are yeah. things I don't li like about London, but uh, this is definitely one of the uh, be better things uh, uh, about yeah, this we're, city. We're incredibly privileged here, yeah. and I don't think people always realize how <coughs> what we have access to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I also wanted to talk about uh, uh, about your teaching experience uh, mm -hmm. because I have this one, and uh, uh, <laughs> I, I need to get it signed next time I'm in London. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I love that you have uh, rivers not on on the cover because uh, many people still have troubles with with uh, mastering this knot. <laughs> There's so many ways to go about it. That's just the way I do it, but. Yeah. There's lots of different ways. Yeah. Uh, one thing about this book, uh, well, I, I, I really like this book. Not, not that I uh, uh, followed it through because uh, unfortunately I don't have uh, uh, much time uh, for book binding these days and I, I spend more time <laughs> making tools and stuff. But yeah. uh, what I really liked is that uh, there are so many good uh, fo fo photographic illustrations of the processes and that's something that separates uh, modern book, some modern bookbinding tutorials from what was happening uh, throughout the 20th century and before, because mm. uh, uh, it, was, it, it is so hard to find a well-illustrated old uh, bookbinding tutorial. And that's something that was always uh, attracted me because uh, so I, I have this, uh, uh, this was one of my first uh, bookbinding tutorials and it's, it's also well-illustrated uh, and uh, I loved it, and it's it's well used and well loved <laughs> because uh, yeah, I show I showed it to some of my students as well. And uh, what's uh, uh, how how did you end up with writing a tutorial? And uh, and uh, what's your so teaching experience? The so I've been teaching since 1998, and taking beginners. First of all, beginners to intermediate to rest. I mean, I've taught everything in a mixed class, everyone doing a million different things. So that's been my learning. And now I teach fine binding, the advanced level, um, 
high level uh, city lit, but I teach all over, lots of many things, but I was teaching. And then this publishers wrote to me and said, we wondered if you'd be uh, willing to write a book for us. But what they wanted me to write was a craft, fun project, you know, with- Scrapbooking. And scrapbooking and all of that. And I said, if you want me to write that sort of book, I'm not the person. I said, honestly, because I've been teaching a long time, I, that my students were saying, what book can you recommend to me to get to begin? So you would say all the all the classics, Johnson, yeah, yeah. Watson, and all of the ones, but they were so out of date. There were so many practices that we don't do anymore and use the glue. So I said, yeah, get that one, but don't follow that. Don't do it like that. Don't get a saw. Don't saw <laughs> and, and many things like that. So I, I said to the publishers, what is really, what I think is really missing is a foundational serious book on book binding, not yeah. just fun projects, how to build a book properly with up-to-date practices, you know. Um, so they were a bit reluctant at first. And I said, please trust me, please, please trust me. And it sold eight, over 8,000 copies. So it's doing, it's doing all right. <laughs> Um, so yes, they were they were very good in the end to let me write the book I wanted to write. And then I was really lucky. I was teaching a workshop for my husband's company. He's a graphic designer. And I did a workshop for designers. And one of the designers came and he said, oh, can I take photos whilst we're doing the thing? And he's an amazing photographer. Mm -hmm. And he is real is as fussy about things as I am. <laughs> so of everything being just right. So when I need I everything when I wrote the book, I I, I wrote da 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 needs a photo, 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 photo. So we worked together and I was really organized. I had books made, the same book in 10 different stages, so we could just quickly he would come and we'd do but I think we did it in about three or four days, the entire book. That's she... impressive. That's that's pretty <laughs> fast for 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 such a <laughs> high volume of uh, photographs. Yeah. Uh, I, and so I was really lucky to have him land in my lap because he works very much like me. And we we just he I'd say, did you get it? He said, I don't think that's good enough. I think I need to take a million more shots of the same thing. So yeah, there's some things that I wish I'd taken more photographs of or more, but also the publishers limited it. They yeah. said, you can't have any more. You can't have any more pages. So also chapters, I had other chapters that couldn't go in it, so. Do, 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 does this book have uh, an American edition or it's only printed in Britain? It's it's for sale in America, but it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's an English edition. It sold in America. Okay. And and that, that's 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 uh, that's good because uh, eight thousand copies means that uh, this uh, hobby or craft is still quite popular in in the United Kingdom. Uh, because, I thought it'd sell about two hundred. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't think that any book like that will sell uh, uh, a lot in Russia, for example. Uh, Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, it it's been a wonderful thing. Yeah. You know, I'm. It took nine months of my spare time that I don't have, um, and it was all consuming. So I'm not keen to write part two, although I think we need a, a, another edition, but I'm not, I'm not ready yet. Oh my God. I thought maybe over lockdown I might have a go at it, but I just can't. <laughs> and also I haven't got a lovely photographer anymore. So he's, he's gone, so, well, he's around, but I don't see him anymore, so. That's exactly what I was curious about. I've never written a book, but I've written a few scientific papers and I know what even a few pages of text take uh, to, to make them right and to make the pictures and everything. And then you need to edit it and reread it and reread it. So I assume it well, wasn't so much um, in terms of uh, financial gain. It was more of no. passion. <laughs> no. 
no. I'm not Why would to... anyone write a book? That's basically my question. It's yeah. I mean, I get support. my royalties each year, which is a nice little treat when a little check arrives, but it's not. I'm not going to be able to retire on it. Um, no, I just wanted to do it because I wanted my beginner students to have a foundational guide that I can say, read that. And it's a really useful teaching thing. If I'm busy, I say, just look at that page and I'll be back because I know that person is telling them what I want them to know. <laughs> so it's a very useful uh, technique for teaching. But uh, yeah, to do it nine months of every single spare minute of my life was doing it. And it, it's, I was sick of it. <laughs> absolutely sick of reading it again oh. <laughs> but yeah fortunately there's not been too many typos in there I think it's been all right <laughs> uh, have you uh, thought perhaps of making uh, it into a video course because nowadays you and fewer people learn their craft from books yeah probably I mean it would be good but I would need to to revisit everything again and remake everything again and find someone who would do it and uh, I don't know maybe I, I think I would have been more inclined to do it at the time because I had everything all the models made um, to start again I'd think oh my god not again <laughs> but maybe if I do a volume two maybe it, it should be made into a dvd too I don't know <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Katie, for uh, being with us and uh, uh, talking about uh, your experience and your career and uh, showing us your projects and your workshop. I'm sure this will be inspiring for many people, for many young bookbinders as well, and uh, the people who only start doing, making books, maybe not only young bookbinders, some of them start uh, making books when they're quite old. So uh, this craft is open for everyone. Um, I'd like to say thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. If you haven't subscribed uh, yet, you can do that on our channel on YouTube, uh, or you can follow our podcast on iTunes, uh, uh, Google Podcasts, or uh, SoundCloud. And uh, many special thanks to our supporters on uh, Patreon. Uh, thanks to your uh, financial inputs. We are able to edit these uh, podcasts, and uh, this uh, means a lot to us. We're also planning to add uh, French co-hosts next year if we have enough money for that. So if you are considering supporting us on Patreon, please go uh, use the link below in the description and uh, add the, your pledge. Pledges start with only one euro, one dollar or one uh, pound. So it's not much, but it helps us a lot. Uh, many thanks to my co-hosts and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>